Hey everyone, welcome to another Flutterflow video. In this video, we're going to be talking about how to connect to the Google Calendar API. It's going to involve a little bit of coding, so let's just buckle our seatbelts and get right into it. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is change the title on the main page here. I'm going to change it to add event to calendar. And then what I'm gonna do is go to our column here and I'm gonna right click and click wrap widget and I'm gonna wrap it in a container. And before I do anything else, I'm gonna go to the root of our homepage here and I'm gonna uncheck safe area because we want the container to fill the whole page. Then what I'm gonna do is set the width of the container to infinite. And then I'm going to set the fill color to secondary background. And because I'm going to set it to the secondary background, I'm going to uncheck our dark mode theme here. So it doesn't automatically change to dark. It just stays white. And then what I'm going to do is add a container inside of our column here. And for this container, I'm going to remove the height and set the width to 250. And then inside of this container, I'm actually going to add another column. And then inside of this column, I'm going to add two containers. And for this column, I'm actually going to set the cross axis alignment to the left and add item spacing of 10 and start spacing of 10 as well. So in our containers here, the first container, I'm going to remove the height and set the width to infinite. And then I'm going to add a text widget. And in our second container here, I'm actually going to add a text field widget. And I'm also going to set the width to infinite and remove the height for this container as well. And I'm actually going to add a box shadow to this container and I'm also going to add border radius of 10. Great, and so now let's go to our text field here. And the first thing I'm going to do is change the input border type to outline. And then for the border color, I'm actually just going to remove the border color. Let's set that to clear color here. And then I'm also going to set the border radius to 10 as well. Okay, and then what I want to do here is actually uh, select this container here and then we're going to actually convert this to a component so we can reuse it. So let's just name that basic form field or something like that. Great. Okay, so now we have this component that we can reuse. And then on this component, I'm going to go to the root widget here. And I'm actually going to define some component parameters. And the first component parameter I'm going to define is the title text. And let's set this to type string and make sure it's required. And then the second component parameter we're going to set here is the hint text parameter. So let's do the same thing. Let's set that to string and set it to required. Don't forget to hit confirm and great. So let's go back to our homepage here. And then on our homepage, I'm going to set a padding of 50 on our column that's going to hold our, um, our custom components here. So then what I'm going to do is in our custom component here, I'm going to set the first text here to our title text component parameter that we just made and it wants a default variable so we're just going to set that to a space and we're going to hit confirm and then we're going to do a similar thing for the text field here we're going to remove our uh, label text and then in our hint text let's set the hint text to um, our hint text component parameter Okay, now we're going to go back to our home page here and then we're going to go to our component here and then back on our home page, let's actually duplicate this component here in our widget tree and then we're actually going to duplicate the component itself here and we're going to make a another type of form field and we're going to call this the date time form field.
And the changes I'm going to make to the date time form field is to remove the text field from our second container here. And then I'm actually going to set the height of the second container to 50 so it matches what the text field would have been. And then inside of this container, I'm actually going to add a text widget. And I'm going to set the alignment on the text widget to middle left. And I'm going to add a left padding of 10. Actually, what I want to do now is add an action to the parent container of the text here. And the action I want to add is under widget UI interactions, the date time picker. And great. So the only thing I want to change for this is under the date time picker type. I want to set it to date and time. So let's close out of here. And in our text here, we're going to set that to the date that's picked by the user from our date time widget. So let's do that. And it also wants a default variable. So let's just press the space bar and hit confirm. Great. So now back to our home page, we're going to add two of the date time widgets. Let's click this button here and go to our component page and let's click the date time widget. And then let's duplicate this date time widget here. So now we have four form fields. And so now let's start setting the parameters. So in our first form field, let's set the title to title and let's just add an example title like soccer practice so that the user knows what to type here. And we can do the same thing for the second basic form field here. Let's set it to description. And let's just set up a sample description for the user. Great. And then we're also going to uh, set the title for the date time widget. For the first one, we're going to set start time. And I almost forgot I want to add a button to this column. And let's just add padding of 30 to the top. And then we can set it to add event to calendar because that's going to be our button that we click when we want to submit our event. All right. And I realized I don't actually need the hint text parameter for our date time component here. So let's just go to our date time component here. And let's remove this second hint text parameter because we don't really need that. Um, okay. And then let's add the title of end time to our second date time component here. Great. So now that that's done, let's go to the custom code tab here and let's click this blue add button here and click action here because we want to create an action that's going to be triggered. So let's click that and that'll create a new custom action for us. And the first action we're going to create is going to format our event data into JSON because the Google Calendar API only accepts an event in a JSON format. So what we're going to do is we're going to name this action something like event to JSON. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set a return value for the action. And this return value is going to be of type JSON because we want to return the JSON object that we're creating out of the action so that we can use it in our other actions. And also make sure that nullable is not checked. And after we set our return value, we're going to define some arguments that go into the function. So the first argument I want to set is the title text from the text field on our first custom component. And we're going to make sure that's set to type string and set to not nullable as well. And then I want to create another argument. And this argument is going to be our description. And it's also going to be of type string. And we want it not to be nullable. 
and then we're going to create another argument and this argument is going to be our start time is going to be from our date time component so we're actually going to set this type to date time because that's what the date time widget will give us and we want to also set this to not nullable and then we want to do the same thing with our end time we want to set it to type date time and we're going to make sure it's not nullable and now that we've done all that, we could actually click this little green square with the code icon on it and we can access the boilerplate code that's generated by Flutterflow for us. That basically includes all of the information that we just created, like uh, that's returning a JSON object, which is a dynamic type. And then it accepts the string title, the string description, the date time variable called start time and the date time variable called end time. And all we have to do is click the blue button here to copy it to our editor and then we can start writing our code inside of the brackets here. So what I want to do in this function is outline our JSON variable. So let's define a variable called JSON. So let's write final JSON equals curly braces. And then what we're going to do is define our first parameter inside of the JSON that Google Calendar accepts, which is summary. So the summary parameter is effectively the title. So we'll just write summary and we'll surround that by single quotes and then we'll add a colon and we'll just write our title variable which is the first argument we defined uh, for our function so we're going to do the same thing for the description and this one is just titled description we're going to put that in single quotes and then add a colon and then write description put a comma there make sure to put your commas then for our start time the word that google calendar uses is actually start so we're going to write start and put that in single quotes and then we're going to add a colon and then in another set of curly braces we're going to write date time and put that in single quotes and then we're going to write colon and then we're going to write start time dot two UTC dot two ISO eight six oh one string open bracket close bracket. We're going to make sure to add our comma here and then what we're going to do is set our end parameter. So let's write end, put that in curly braces and then add a colon and then add a pair of curly braces. And then inside of the curly braces here, let's write date time and then add a colon and then end time dot two UTC bracket bracket dot two ISO 8601 string. And then we can just end this JSON off with a semicolon. So now that we've formatted our event in JSON, we can actually just return this JSON from our action. So go ahead and make sure to select the save action button here on the right hand side or else it won't save. And then what I actually want to do now is add our next function. So let's click the add button again, click action. And this action is going to be our sign in with Google action. And the reason why we can't use the built in sign in with Google action in Flutterflow is because we need to be able to use the access token that comes from the authentication process. But I'm pretty sure that's not possible with the built in sign in with Google. So I just made my own sign in with Google functionality uh, that works just fine. And we can access the token and then we can use that token in our next function. So then like we did before, let's define return value and it's going to be of type string. And I guess we can set it to nullable because sometimes it won't actually return. So before I define some arguments, I want to define some dependencies and the dependency I want to use is the Google sign in package. Um, you can just define a dependency by writing the package name exactly how it's spelt in pub dev and do a colon and then write any if you're not sure which version of the package will be compatible with Flutterflow, you can just write a colon and then write any that usually works for me. Great. So now that that's done, we can generate our boilerplate action code so that looks good to me so let's copy that to the editor and then I want to make sure Google sign in package is imported so you can actually just write this line to import it and if you don't know how to import the package you can always just look it up on pub dev and it'll usually show you an example with the import so you can just copy that but uh, for this example you can just write what I write And usually there'll be an error saying that the package is not imported correctly. Sometimes it helps to hit that green button beside pub spec dependencies, but usually just give the page a refresh and it usually goes away. So um, let's do that. Let's 
let's go back to our sign in with Google function. And yeah, it looks like the package doesn't have any errors. So let's start writing our code. So first thing I'm going to do is define a variable of type Google sign in. I'm going to just call it Google sign in. And we're going to make sure that equals Google sign in. And we're going to add some brackets and then we're going to define a couple of things. The first thing we're going to define is our client ID and let's just set that to an empty string right now. And then we're going to also define some scopes, which we can also leave empty right now. I'm also going to define a Google sign in account variable. And make sure to add a question mark to the end of that so that it can do a proper null check if the user closes out of the Google sign in account pop up. So let's just call that Google sign in account and we'll set that to equals await Google sign in dot sign in should be good. And I, I didn't spell Google right. So let's fix that. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to write final Google sign in authentication. Equals await Google sign in account dot authentication. And what we have to do is also make sure that we add a exclamation mark to the Google sign in account definition here because there's still a chance we could return a null um, and we just have to do some null checking. So let's keep going here. And the final thing I want to do is return our access tokens so we can actually access that from the Google sign in authentication variable um, dot access token and then semicolon. Perfect. So that looks good to me. And I actually want to do some error checking. So let's just add a quick try catch block over all this code here. So let's just type try curly brace curly brace. Let's just copy this and put that in there. And then at the end of our curly brace, let's just write catch. And then we can write in brackets error. And then inside of the curly braces here, let's just print a statement so that we can uh, log that there's been an error. So let's just write error signing in with Google. That works fine. And then we're actually going to return null if the sign in failed for some reason. So remember to make sure to hit the save button here on the side and then let's move on here. So what I want to do is add another action. The action I'm going to add is add event to calendar. And then we're also going to, as per usual, define our arguments and whatnot. So this is the function that's going to connect to the Google API and it's going to add our event to the calendar. So we don't actually need to define a return value because we're not returning anything. We're just adding an event to the calendar. So we need to pass the access token in one of our arguments and it's just a string. So we can set that to type string and let's make sure that's not nullable as per usual. And why don't we just start there and and go to our boilerplate code here and just add that to our action here. And then we're going to start defining some variables. So the first thing we want to do is when we're working with an API, we need to pass some headers with basic information like our access token. So um, let's define that. So we're going to write final headers equals curly braces. And then inside the curly braces, we're going to add single quotes. And then inside the single quotes, we're going to write authorization. And then we're going to put colon. And then beside bearer, we're going to define our access token. And in case you don't know, in order to add a variable in a string, you need to add a dollar sign and then write the variable name. So beside bearer, we're just going to put a dollar sign and then write access token. And then outside of the quote there, we're going to put a comma. So that's great. And then we're also going to define the content type as our application JSON.
that is great. So let's just finish that off with a semicolon. And then we're going to define the variable that's actually going to be the call to the Google Calendar. So let's write final response and let's set that to equal await. Um, actually, we need, to, we need to import a Dart package, uh, HTTP, to make a call across the internet. So let's just define that quickly here. package http slash http dot dart and we're going to write as http so that we can use http every time we want to reference this package so after await we're going to write http dot post with a semicolon and then inside of this, we're gonna define the URI that we're gonna send our event to. So we're gonna write URI.parse, and then let's open these uh, parentheses here. And I actually can't remember the URI that we need to use to e insert an event into the Google Calendar. So let's just look that up quickly here. Google Calendar API event URI. Okay, so let's see. Okay, this is from Google for developers. Let's scroll down until we find a calendars calendars events here we go so right here is the base uri so every uri needs to have this so let's go back to our custom code here and just paste that in in single quotes And so then let's go back to this website here and we're going to use the insert event uh, call here. And you can see it's defined as a post call, which is what we've already set up. And we're going to paste that on the end of our URI. Great. So that'll post whatever information we have to this URI. And then we need to add our headers. And let's just write headers colon is our headers. And the last thing we need to define is our body. So um, for the body, we actually haven't um, added an argument to accept our JSON event that will come out of our first custom action. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another argument and let's just name that something like JSON event. And then this is going to be obviously of type JSON and let's make sure that's not nullable and then as you can see in our boilerplate code it'll say that we should have a dynamic JSON argument in our function so let's just copy that and then add that to the arguments in our function here and then what I actually want to do is not just write JSON event, but I want to JSON encode that. Um, so in our body, let's just write encode JSON event and then put a comma. And so now our response is actually done. And what I want to do finally is just check if the response worked. So I'm going to write if response dot status code equals 200, which means success. Uh, we're going to write uh, event inserted successfully. and then write an else statement. And then we're gonna print error inserting event. And then we're gonna reference the response status code. And then we're gonna just also print uh, whatever comes out of the response so that uh, if we do have an issue, we can just look at the console and then figure out what's going on from what's printed to the console. And I actually think that's good. So we're just gonna go ahead and save this. And then we're gonna go back to our widget tree and set this up. So let's select our button here and let's open our action flow editor. And let's go down here to the bottom, custom actions. And the first action we wanna add is that event to JSON action, cause we wanna convert the information in our custom components into arguments that are gonna go in our function. So as you can see, we can define our arguments here for our actions. So let's set the title argument to the first basic form field and just select the text field here. That'll grab the text from the first text field. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the description, widget state, basic form field, 
old text field. And then for the start time, we're actually gonna grab the date time from the first date time form field. And we're just gonna confirm that. And then we're gonna do the same thing for the second date time component. Perfect. And then really important, we wanna name the output from our action here to created event because it's the event we've created in our action. So let's define another action. And the next action we're gonna add is with the sign in with Google action. And we didn't need any arguments for that. We just have an output and that output was our access token, if you remember. So we're just gonna write access token to keep it simple. And then after adding the sign in with Google action, we're going to add our final action, which is our add event to calendar action. So for the arguments we defined, we're gonna set the access token to the output from our previous action. So under action outputs, we're gonna select access token. And then for the JSON event, I wanna select the created event, which was what we named the event that comes out of our first action, the event to JSON action. So perfect, let's hit confirm. And then we're actually all good to go for our adding event to calendar. And then, let's go to our date time form field here and for the text that represents the date we pick I want to select this little icon here and then I want to actually set a format that the date is displayed in so the format I want to set is going to be custom and I have a specific format I like so I'm gonna write that out you don't have to copy me but this is what I recommend for this example so now just hit confirm. So in our basic form field here, I actually wanna remove the padding. And then everything else looks good. Um, we're gonna move on to the Google console now. So let's just search Google console. And then we can click this link and that'll bring us to console.cloud.google.com. And as you can see, I have a project already opened called Google Calendar, but what we're gonna do is set up a new project and then we can select our project right here and let's select new project. Let's rename this project to something like Calendar API or whatever you want. And we don't need to set the location, so let's just hit create. And as you can see, it's creating the project. So let's just select a project here and it'll say you're working in calendar API or whatever project you make. So perfect. What we want to do is start enabling stuff. And the reason why we have to do this all is because Google wants to keep track of who is accessing their services uh, and in what app. And this also allows us to set our permissions and whatnot. So what we want to do is go back to that hamburger icon here and under APIs and services, let's just go to the first one enabled APIs and services. And as you can see, See, there's a button here at the top that says enable APIs and services. So we'll click that. And then the APIs we want to enable are first the people API. Um, so that when we're signing in, we can have access to the information. And then the second one we want to add is the Google Calendar API. So just search calendar and you'll find it here. Just click to enable that. And once that's done, we can get out of here. And second thing you wanna do is go to your OAuth consent screen. And then what you wanna do is click external and then click create and then name your project something. It won't actually work if you put Google in the name I found out. So just put calendar API or something like that. Put a user support email, I'm gonna put my email. You can put the same email for the developer contact information, doesn't matter. Just save and continue. We don't actually need to define our scopes here so we can just actually keep going. Test users, kind of important, unless we wanna set our project to be in production. What we wanna do is just add whatever email the calendar's on so that you can allow this email to access the Google Calendar through your app. So just write your email and click add and then save and continue. This looks great to me. We can actually just go to credentials now. This is where we generate that client ID that we've been trying to get to this whole time. Um, so so under create credentials, click OAuth client ID and set the application type. We can set it to web. Let's just name this calendar API 
client. We also need to authorize the Flutterflow origin and redirect URIs so that Google knows that Flutterflow is a trusted source. So let's just open a new tab here. We're just gonna search Google sign in Flutterflow and the first link here, the Google sign in from Flutterflow docs. We're actually just gonna scroll down here to step number six. So we can see that we have two links here. So the first link is like ff debug service blah 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 and then the second one is the app.flutterflow.io url so uh what we're gonna do is we're gonna copy this first one and we're gonna go back to our google console here and in the authorized javascript origins we're actually gonna add this link and we're gonna put https colon slash slash and then we're gonna do the same thing for the second one app.flutterflow.io Uh, we're going to put that in there and we're actually going to add the same two links to our authorized redirect URIs. So we'll just copy both of those, put those in there. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that they have outlined what needs to be added to the URIs. So just copy that and put that at the end and then do the same thing for the app.flutterflow links and that should be good to go. So just click create and it'll tell us our client ID. Um, so what you need to do is copy the client ID. I've blurred mine out, but it'll be like .apps.googleusercontent Dot com and you just you just copy that or if you've closed out of there by accident you can just go back to your calendar api client and then you can see it in there so we'll just copy that and let's go back to our app and then in our sign in with google action we're going to paste that in and the other thing we need to add is our scopes so when we're authenticating with google we need to outline the permissions we're actually asking for uh, from our user so that's defined in the scopes so we can actually look up what scopes we need to use for a project so let's just open a new tab and search google api scopes and the first link here it'll show us the, the oauth 2.0 scopes for google apis can scroll down till we find the calendar API scopes. So the ones I had in my original code were the googleapis.com auth calendar scope and then the googleapis.com auth calendar event scope. I'm not 100% sure if you need both, but I just had them both just in case there was an issue. Um, but uh, if you experiment and you find out that you only need the one, uh, just, then just let me know. But I'm gonna put them both in there. and that's good for our scopes I just always make sure to save so now that we've set up our scopes and everything i'm gonna actually go ahead and go through a test run of the app and it's not gonna work because we don't actually have the right um redirect uris and we also haven't authorized the domain to get the right link we need to test the project let's just put in some sample data here It's going to give us an error. It's going to say this app's request is invalid. 
and if we click to see the error details it'll show us the right link that we should be using it's a little bit different um, it just has the word free in it I don't know what yours is gonna look like mine might just look like that because I'm using the free version of Flutterflow for this um, but yeah go ahead and copy that and then go back to your Google console and you're going to want to swap out the original ff-debug-service link with uh, this new one here. So you're going to want to switch it out in the authorized JavaScript origins and also the authorized redirect URIs. And then just for kicks, also go to the OAuth consent screen and then we're going to open that up and we're going to go to under authorized domains, just add flutterflow.io and then also add this new ff-debug uh, link as well. And we can save and continue that. Once we've done that, we can actually restart this project. And then let's just put in some information. Let's pretend we have a final exam tomorrow that we're procrastinating on. And then add some description like what room it's in. And then we can actually click the start time and end time uh, widgets here to open our date time pickers. And we can pick some times. We can say it starts at 9 a.m. And then we can also say that it ends at 11.45 tomorrow. And then all we have to do is click add event to calendar. And then it'll start the authentication process. So it'll ask us to choose an account. I'll choose my email. And then after that, it'll say that Google hasn't verified this app, which is true because we haven't put it in production yet. Uh, but you can just click continue and then continue again. And then here's where it's pulling from the scopes that we set. So it's asking us to confirm that. So we want our app to be able to access these two things. Things. So we'll just hit select all and then we'll hit continue. And then we can see here on the side in the console, it'll say event inserted successfully, which is what we wrote in our code for when we get the success 200 code. So we can go over here to our Google calendar, which I've opened and we can see we have our final exam event and great. See, there's also some other things that we can define, but uh, for this tutorial, I've chosen just to keep it simple, but you can always look up the Google calendar uh, API JSON and it'll show you all the different specs you can set for an event. Great, so we've successfully added this to our calendar. So if you made it this far, make sure to pat yourself on the back first of all. I also have a Discord server linked in the description. So if you have problems like this in your project and you wanna get them solved, feel free to join up and post your problem and have the community join together to help solve the problem for you. It's always a great way to stay motivated by surrounding yourself with uh, like-minded individuals. So I highly recommend uh, hopping on the server and taking full advantage of that resource. Source. So that concludes this video and as always stay cool and I will see you in the next one.